reach past all we can see, hear and touch, beyond all we understand, lies... The Extraordinary. We're ready. Will you all come aboard, please? The Extraordinary is the hidden mystery that lies behind Australia's first commercial airline disaster. A mystery unraveled by seances and a trans-Tasman psychic link. Charles, got out. Charles, you were, you were a pilot. Why not you were the co-pilot of the Southern Cloud? Shh. It is something that allows this woman to communicate with the dead. Not the normal dead, but some of the great names of history. It's not like writing a novel, really. It's like reading it. It is the plan by this doctor to create a master race, a generation of children to think, invent and create far beyond the level of the rest of us. The extraordinary is actor Rod Steiger's life experience with forces that cannot be explained. My mother was a frustrated performer and an actress. And I look at her and all of a sudden, I said, you slut, you tramp, you goddamn alcoholic. It is the story of the desperate cry for help heard by a young bushman, a cry he ignored, and one that haunts him to this day. Just some of the stories that lie beyond our normal understanding tonight on The Extraordinary. Good evening. I'm Warwick Moss. The Southern Cloud took off with its six passengers on the morning of March 21, 1931 and headed south from Sydney into a darkening sky. It never reached its destination. In the tense hours that followed, Australia knew it had experienced its first commercial airline disaster. We didn't know. We were also about to enter a 27-year wait to solve the mystery of the cloud's disappearance. And behind that story lies an even deeper mystery one that's consumed the private thoughts of TV and radio personality Keith Smith for over 60 years. On this day, the weather is turning foul. 100 knot winds and heavy rainstorms lie ahead. Only an experienced pilot would brave such conditions. We're ready, will you all come aboard please? Six people are taking the trip. Four men and two women. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Melbourne will be the next stop. I hope so, mate. Several, like theatre producer Clyde Hood, had flown before. For the others, it was their first adventure into the air, and their last. For that day, the Southern Cloud, with its pilot, co-pilot and six passengers, would simply vanish, becoming Australia's first commercial aviation disaster, and one of aviation's most enduring mysteries. The Southern Cloud, with six passengers and a crew of two, took off from Sydney on March 21, 1931. It flew south, meeting 100 mile an hour headwinds, and was never seen again. For weeks, other planes searched over rugged country like this. Ground parties tried to penetrate the forest, but the mystery of the Southern Cloud remained unsolved. One young Australian devoured by the mystery was Keith Smith. He collected every newspaper clipping and photograph he could find following every move in the search for the missing plane.
But as the weeks, months, and then years passed without even a trace of the plane being found, Keith, like thousands of other Australians, pushed the mystery to the back of his mind. He later went on to become a favourite on Australian radio and television, hosting programs such as The Pied Piper Show and A Word from Children. But Keith Smith began his career as a broadcaster on ABC Radio, where he specialised in shows on paranormal phenomena. One day in early 1952, he was asked to record a seance, a supposed communication with spirits, or beings who had passed on into the afterlife. Now, before we start the seance, I would like you to follow a few steps. It would be there, 21 years after Southern Cloud's disappearance, that Keith Smith's memory was to be jogged in a most peculiar way. The spirit world will enter the room and the trumpets will rise. The seance was to be an unusually sophisticated one. Through the presence of the medium, various spirits were to be contacted. These spirits would then associate themselves with what are called seance trumpets, causing them to rise up into the air. These simply formed sheets of cardboard would allow the contacted spirits to actually talk to people in the room. In other words, the trumpets would give voice to beings who normally had none. Now we should remember that Keith Smith was no devout believer in the hereafter, nor a regular seance goer. He was at this psychic gathering as an objective, perhaps sceptical, investigative journalist. Well, I watched, and uh, as the power built, people started to sing. The medium went into trance, first of all, and as they sang, to my astonishment, the trumpet slowly floated off the floor in the darkness, covered in paint, remember, up to the ceiling. As the trumpets began to rise and hover, Keith scrutinised them carefully. And after a time, to my surprise, one floated in front of me. I didn't know what to do. I put my hand around it to see if there was anything holding it up. It wasn't. Hello. I pushed it away. It came back again. And then a small voice came out of it. It said, Charles Daniel. The voice uttered a name which Keith Smith had no recollection of. At least, not immediately. I said, I don't know any Charles Daniel. And with some show of impatience, it said the name again, Charles Daniel. And then, like a small bell in my mind, I remembered. And he said, Southern Cloud. The voice said, yes, yes. I said, wait a minute, you were a pilot. The co-pilot, the co-pilot of the Southern Cloud. Oh my God. Very excited the voice was. And uh, then being a true young reporter full of drama, I asked the obvious question. I said, where did you all end up? Keith Smith left that seance carrying a healthy load of scepticism. But then how could anyone there have known about his obsession with the southern cloud all those years ago? Hungry with curiosity, young Keith Smith scoured his scrapbooks and maps. Eventually, he pinpointed the tiny village of Upoti Potpon in Victoria. But to his disappointment, it was hundreds of kilometres off the southern cloud's flight path. And there for Keith Smith, the mystery might have rested. That is, if there hadn't been one more unnerving link. Some years later, in 1952, I was doing a program on ABC called Happy to Know You, all about migrants, and we were looking for missing migrants, people who'd been lost in World War II. And I got a letter from a listener who'd heard the program, a listener in New Zealand, and he said, I'm a radiesthetist. I'd never heard of it. I looked in the dictionaries, couldn't find it. He said, but I have the ability, given a picture and a map, to tell you whether that person is living or dead and where that person is. Send me a, a picture of a migrant and you can test me. The letter was tempting. On impulse, Keith Smith sent this radiesthetist a newspaper photograph of one Miss Glasgow, one of the passengers aboard the ill-fated Southern Cloud. What the radiesthetist sent back was a map marked with a rough fix of Miss Glasgow's remains. 
It was nowhere near the Victorian town of Upoti Potpon, but hundreds of kilometres away in southern New South Wales. I put it in the too hard basket and I was doing my Pied Piper program with the children at the time. I went to Queensland to do the show and one morning travelling between schools looking for children, I saw a courier mail banner outside a lolly shop and it said, Southern Cloud Wreckage Found. I grabbed the paper and I couldn't wait to get back to Sydney. The wrecked airliner has been found, lying where it crashed as it tried to clear the top of a mountain in the Southern Alps. The plane lies up there in almost impenetrable bush. Tom Saunter, a carpenter, found the plane on a walking tour. The Southern Cloud, found after 27 years. And when I returned to Sydney, I took my little map to civilization over at Ball's Head Point, and the experts poured over it and I watched. And they decided that with a whole world to choose from, the radiesthetist in New Zealand had pinpointed the wreckage of the Southern Cloud exactly. Four months before a carpenter on his Sunday off had walked into the bush at a place called Happy Jack in southern New South Wales on a snowy scheme and stumbled over the wreckage. The actual location of the Southern Cloud and Miss Glasgow's remains lay just kilometres away from the spot marked by the radiesthetist. On the map he was using, just one half of a centimetre away. And this four months before Southern Cloud was found. But what about you potty potpon? Charles Dunnell's ghostly message in a seance years before. Is it possible that the Southern Cloud had overflown that small town where Charles Dunnell believed they'd crashed before going on to some rendezvous with fate in Southern New South Wales? If so, does that mean that a mistake made in this life can somehow remain unresolved, undiscovered even, in a life hereafter? In other words, was Charles Dunnell's message that of a genuine and genuinely confused ghost? And how did that New Zealand radiesthetist come this close? But it sounds cranky. But what she can't explain is why she can write at a speed of 2,000 words an hour. That's a complete novel in a day. Sometimes I have her direct voice, my name, and hello, love. And one morning I saw a face on the wall, a Chinese oriental face. And as I watched, I blinked and looked again. Still there, you know, had a look. I watched it and it just faded away. So I think clairvoyance is going to come. I think I'm going to develop and I shall be able to see them. And then I'll know it's these people. Stella Horrocks had never aspired to be an author. Then, 20 years ago, she began writing like a woman possessed. Page after page, book after book. I put my pencil on my paper, nothing happened. And I started laughing. I thought, well, it's a good job I'm on my own, as people would think there's something queer here. And so, what happened then? I turned on the television and thought, I'm not going to waste my time sitting here just like this. Might as well read a book or something. I turned the telly on. And I was so interested in watching the programme and I didn't notice that my hand had moved on its own across the page and the board. It was here and it had finished here. I'd never seen it and there was a line. I hadn't done that line. Something else had done that line, not me. Stella alleges that from her pen have come letters, diaries and books, each in different handwriting, from Charles Dickens, Noel Coward, Thomas Hardy and Alfred Hitchcock. They write themselves. I don't have to do any preparation. It just comes. And that's why I've been so interested. It's not like writing a novel, really. It's like reading it. Oh, now, what's he going to do with this? Like in this eternal trial one. Who will she pick? Will she pick the handsome, dashing captain? Or will she pick Lord Lister? I didn't know who she picked until the last page. 
and my hand is the one that received it through. It's so interesting. Charles Dickens. Now that was the marathon, the blockbuster. When I typed that out second round, there was over 700 pages. Now it was a blockbuster to me, because I'm only a one bump 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 typist. But Stella lives in Bronte country. Deepest, darkest Yorkshire was the inspiration for many a Bronte novel. Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights among them. And Penistone Hill, where I am now, is apparently where Heathcliff met Cathy. And it would seem that Charlotte Bronte is the latest to seek immortality through Stella's pen. It takes a lot of effort on both sides. Sometimes it goes so quickly, I jerk, 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 it's jerking me working through it. And sometimes it comes more smoothly. It depends on the person who's trying to communicate because they've all a different touch. But how does Stella know they are who they say they are? No coward. He came through the first time. I said, oh, it can't be you. And he says, put your work down and don't get in a temper. He says, go for a walk up to Whipsy Park and I. Prove it's me. And so I was fed up with the writing anyhow. So I got my coat and my Macintosh on. It was wild and wet and I wandered away up to Whipsy Park. It's about 20 minutes up a hill and round. And I had to go through a little road, side road, called Mount Road. And when I was going through Mount Road, an extra special big gust of wind came from the west, where the rain comes from. And it blew, I was crossing the road, and it blew me, so my foot caught against the edge of the pavement and I nearly fell full length onto the pavement and there, right in front of my eyes, was a programme for Blythe Spirit by Noel Coward. Well, the programme happened to be for the year before. Now, how had it got there, just in the very place where I would trip up? And he couldn't have chosen a better programme, could he, Blythe Spirit? <laughs> It's easy to dismiss Stella as a, an eccentric but thoroughly charming old lady who immerses herself in this writing as a means of soaking up the long and perhaps the lonely hours. But during my visit here, there's been one thing that's made me think again. By chance, we met Dorothy, a neighbour. Dorothy lost her partner, Tony, last year. On the day of the funeral, she says she received a letter from him through Stella. Hello, I never thought I'd be with you so soon this week. I should have heeded the chest pains. I knew that if he could get through, he would get through. Um, and Stella was the likely person. And this is Tony's signature here. And this is the one that came through to me from Stella. And as you'll see, they're very, very much alike. Which is gifted. She really is. I go on with it because I want to know what comes next. But there's so many, they tell me there's a really long queue of authors wanting to come through. Oscar Wilde's been a time but only is very witty. He wrote some very witty sayings. There's a queue. And the next in line is apparently Thomas Hardy, who's returning to finish off some work he started with Stella some years ago. Coming up. The plan to create super kids, a special generation of children bred with genius sperm to create a master race. Every youngster is, is such a dandy contribution to our population. Actor Rod Steiger and experiences that cannot be explained. I thought about suicide. I thought about it a lot. In fact, it shows you about social conditioning. The thing that bothered me the most was not the fact that I would be dead. I didn't want to leave a mess. Bert Weston is 90 years old. For 70 years, he's carried the burden of guilt. Bert says he ran away from a cry for help, scared off by a ghost. The plan 
was to create a master race, to start a generation of children who would think, invent, lead and succeed on a level way above the rest of us, a super race of humans. If the scenario sounds familiar, like something out of Germany in the 40s, think again. The plan is in existence today, and it's happening in the USA. Welcome to the private world of Dr. Graham. He's making human beings here. It may sound as spooky as it looks. It may disturb you. Most of us like to leave this sort of thing to God or nature. But before we let Impulse cast Dr. Graham as a Dr. Frankenstein, we ought to know a few things about his work and why so many women come to him asking to be impregnated by his very select supply of male sperm. And they come to us because they want the best child they can have. And that's a very good motive. These youngsters are so curious and alert, active, and the parents are so proud of them. Call him Frankenstein, Dr. Graham, or what you will. The 86-year-old Californian doctor will tell you he's just trying to make humans better than the current model. And for 30 years, he's been developing prototypes of a higher being that can think faster, invent sooner, create better, and save all of us from extinction. Robert Graham is in search of the perfect human. We're recruiting ex excellence from every race, every place we can find it. I'd like to see good leaders, inventors, there are lots of things to yet to be, problems yet to be solved. It would be nice if somebody could figure out a cure for the common cold. It would be nice if somebody would figure out how to take the salt out of the ocean water. So how does he go about fulfilling his vision? He started in 1980 by soliciting the sperm of the best of the best. He sought out Nobel Prize winners who were willing to donate their seed for mankind. Every youngster is, is such a dandy contribution to our population. They're not our troublemakers. They're our potential trouble solvers, our leaders, our thinkers. Dr. Graham has long since run out of willing Nobel donors so he leafs through the next best VIP guides, like who's who in science and engineering. There are a lot of no's, but enough super IQs willing to give for the cause that Graham currently turns out 13 of his superhuman species a year. This is a, a beautiful youngster by our German donor. For a while we had an a outstanding German donor. He was a a wonderfully handsome man and very bright and very successful. He was just everything. He's a hero. His proudest achievement may be 10-year-old Doran Blake, born to a psychologist mother who wanted more than an average father to her child. Early on, Doran showed signs of advanced intelligence and creativity. His talents ranged from music to computer science. Doran was very tired the night we met him, but his uniqueness would not be dimmed. Math is just so fascinating to me. I love the way it works. And I love hard math that I'm doing with my grandma. Algebra is very, very fun. So it's, it's the funnest thing I've ever done in my life. Well, not the funnest, but one of the funnest things. Dr. Graham's sperm bank is housed in an average looking building in Escondido, California. But his super children are spread all across America. 181 so far. They carry the genes of the superior minds of the world, and in most cases they have shown rare talent in a particular field, whether music or maths, science or literature. Doran Blake's father is test tube 28. His mother, Afton Blake, couldn't be happier with their offspring. He didn't read especially early, 
But he went from kindergarten where he learned to read in the beginning of kindergarten to reading Shakespeare by the end. So in a nine month period, he, he went from re just beginning to read to college level. In Dr. Graham's lab, the donor's personal history is color coded and annotated in files, along with similarly categorized vials of yet to be used sperm. The so-called Nobel Sperm Bank was actually conceived by famous geneticist Dr. Herman Muller, and Graham simply sees himself as carrying on his master's work. What I'm trying to do is not propagate anything that's adverse. Diseases, stupidity. Doran has known from the beginning he is one of the specially conceived, and as with most of the Nobel kids, he's set his sights on a future somewhat more lofty than the kid next door. He's read through a library of books most adults wouldn't attempt, and has for years been designing his own computer programs. I want to be a computer scientist for my main job, but, uh, but along with being a computer scientist, I'll do a lot of other things. My dad is one of the top computer scientists in the world. And because I'm very good with computers, I was born with an instinct for computers and electronics. Dr. Graham's experiment is in its transitional stage, and he believes it's working beyond his wildest dreams. I was born, or not even born, but I was produced a little different way. I mean, I don't... I don't feel different, I don't want to be different or anything. I just want to be a regular kid. And his life experience with forces that cannot be explained is riveting. Raphael Abramovitz met Steiger at his Hollywood home. I sit there and my mother was a frustrated performer and an actress. And I look at her and all of a sudden, I said, you slut, you tramp, you goddamn alcoholic. He was nominated for an Academy Award in The Pawnbroker and he won the Oscar two years later for In the Heat of the Night. But Rod Steiger is not acting here. He's at his home in Malibu talking about his mother on the edge of death. You will notice that whenever Steiger talks about his mother, he is near tears. The scene he has just described we will more fully explain in a few moments. But to truly understand its impact, it is necessary to know the excruciating love-hate relationship between mother and son. I used to take my mother out of the pubs and out of the saloons. And of course, the neighborhood, especially the kids, weren't too kind. You know, I remember beating the bejesus out of a kid because <laughs> he called my mother a drunken muffin. When I got to be 16, I searched out and found my mother, God, I'll never forget, in a rooming house. She was in a place called Down Neck Newark, which is just what it was. It was really down, neck, dirty, you're out, homeless Newark, you know. And, uh, I said, you got to sign this paper. Because this paper says it's okay with you. I can go in the Navy and I'm only 16 and a half. And she was drunk. She said, I'm not signing. I said, I'll break your arm. I'll break your arm. I have that kind of terror. For all of that, hidden behind his Hollywood stardom, Steiger's mother was all he had. He was only in the presence of his natural father until he was four months old. Somebody said, what would happen if he walked in your dressing room? today. And I said, I don't know. I don't know if I'd cry or break his jaw. But Steiger's mother is another story, and buried in that lifelong inner struggle is perhaps the answer to that moment in a Los Angeles hospital when he did what doctors could not do. He brought her out of a coma and back to life. If I didn't know the power of anger myself, perhaps, I wouldn't know how to use it on her upsetting her so that I tricked her into having an emotion save her life. Steiger believes he found a bond, a common instinct of communication that seemed to be shared only by people lost in the kind of deep depression that filled his world in the pawnbroker. 
Steiger has known its darkest abyss. He once entered a trance-like depression for ten years, unable to act, take care of himself, or get out of his chair. I thought about suicide. I thought about it a lot. In fact, it shows you about social conditioning. The thing that bothered me the most was not the fact that I would be dead. I didn't want to leave a mess. I didn't want to have blood on the wall, or blood on the flowers, or blood on the cat that my daughter or my wife could see. That I was no longer in existence was not important. So I figured out how to do it, because I live near the ocean, I rent a little rowboat, I row out, I have the gun in one hand, the other hand holds the boat, I lower myself over, I put the gun in my mouth, I blow my brains out, the boat goes one way, I go the other way, and there's fish food and no mess. If depressives can communicate on some other level, Steiger was ready for his encounter with actress Inger Stevens, about the same time as the incident with his mother. Stevens qualified too. She would take her own life two years later. I'm doing a picture called uh, Cry Terror. One of the scenes in the picture, we're running down the subway, and this jackass who's directing it has decided he wants to shoot in the subway and he's going to put the generators down there. He didn't realize the generators are pumping carbon monoxide. We get to a shot where I chase Inga Stevens down the subway. While we run down, we're doing the shot. She passes camera and she passes out. I catch her. Steiger and Stevens were rushed to the hospital. Doctor comes over and says, I don't know what we're going to do. She won't take, she won't breathe. She won't take enough oxygen in. And I remember my mother. So I said, okay. Oh so I did everything I could think of. I can't say it on television, what I call this person. You second-rate talent, you greasy go God. I mean, improvise. I was going crazy. But the most dramatic example Steiger comes back to is his mother. She was lying in a coma in a Los Angeles hospital. Steiger was called. They told me that she's going to die. They called me on the West Coast. Get there as soon as you can. So I get there, I get to the hospital. They said, uh, she's not going to make it. It's interesting. I said, why? She's too sick. And he says, no, she doesn't want to. I said, I beg your pardon? Talk about choice over death. She has chosen, she don't want to. We can't get her to come out of the anesthetic. I go up, and she's in an oxygen tent, the old-fashioned ones, and I sit there, and my mother was a frustrated performer and an actress. And I look at her, and all of a sudden, I said, you slut, you tramp. You goddamn alcoholic. How you couldn't sing if your life depended on it. You didn't look good enough. You didn't sound good enough. Now, the room was full of people and doctors. I'm crying when I'm saying this. The nurses are crying. Everybody's, what kind of a son is this? I said, you're not worth beans. You couldn't ever be a performer. She raised her right hand and came out. I knew if I got her angry, I got my mother back. Tonight in the Sydney suburb of Greenwich, a 90-year-old man gazes at the stars, remembering a time long ago. In a split second, Bert Weston made a decision that changed him forever. That night, Bert could have saved a life but he was scared off, ran away from a cry for help. But there is no question in Bert's mind that on that night, 70 years ago, he saw a ghost. Bert Weston is not the kind of man to make up stories. He lives on his own, does community work, and carries the vivid memory of that night way back in the 1920s. To some of us, in later life, comes nagging thoughts of things we did, things we didn't do, or help we should have given and didn't give. How could I explain, or how could I tell people the story of a, of a figure that appeared in the moonlight and then scared the wits out of horses and out of me, and then dissolved, disappeared. 
the local verdict would be plain. In a country district, I'd done the unspeakable thing of galloping away from a call for help. Back in those days, in, in my, my early twenties, my hobby was riding jumping horses at country shows. This night, I was heading home from a show on the southern tablelands. The air was clear and the night felt good. When we came to a small creek, I dismounted to let the horses take some water, and I walked around them, a little upstream. I remember the water was pure, and especially that it was icy cold. I would recall how cold it was later, when I had to reassure myself I'd been wide awake during the events of this night. It was also a night of a full moon, and as the moon rose higher in the sky, it flooded the countryside with brightness. As I remounted, I sensed the horses were as keen and as happy as I that we were heading home. It had been a long day. As I came up out of the creek, I noticed a homestead, Dingo Creek. It was familiar and I remembered passing this place earlier on my way out to the show. It was about then that I saw it. The figure of a man hurrying down from the farmhouse. There was something strange about the way he looked and moved, waiting to get my attention. It was odd in that he was wearing a funny old white helmet, the ones they called tiger shooters, and he had a white beard white shirt and an old waistcoat that was flapping open. Then, just as suddenly, he disappeared behind a tree by the shed. His waiting had seemed urgent, but when I went behind the shed to find him, he was gone. There was a couple of stockyards there and I made my way to the fence. But there was no sign of him here either. There was just a bull. It seemed peaceful enough at this point, but the old man vanished. Where? cries for help. A woman calling from the veranda. The horse is bolting away. The bull charging. It was chaos. And I panicked. I was scared. I just wanted to get out of there. Help me! Help! And before midnight, we reached the township. And soon after, we were safely, the horse was safely in the stables, and I was in bed. As mysterious, bizarre, otherworldly as the event you have just witnessed might appear, I should remind you that Bert Weston is a real man who was in this real room on that very real night on the 16th of May 1923, some 70 years ago. Next morning, in the light of day, the terrifying events of the night didn't seem so bad, but I was puzzled. I thought I'd, I'd find, find out, out something, something that might explain what had happened. I had a terrible feeling that I had failed someone the night before. Have a beer, mate. Yeah, thanks. The men were talking about a farmer named Jack Hearn who had a property. called Dingo Creek. And my heart froze. I tried to stay calm as I heard how that afternoon Hearn had gone to feed his bull. Something had gone wrong. The bull had charged and gored him. 
Yeah, got him in the belly. You can't get careless with new bulls. Hearn had crawled to the house and collapsed in front of his wife, Lara. There was nobody there to help. Yeah, bleeding real bad. Not much Laura could do for him. Then they talked about an unknown horseman arriving. Me. I was the unknown horseman. And how, when called to help, I'd ridden off into the darkness. And the horseman took off at full belt. This morning the bull was gone. Jack died around midnight. Dear God. But who was the ghostly old man? Could I have imagined that? I knew Jack well. I knew his father as well, old Frank. Funny old chap. Used to wear this old tiger shooting helmet. I remember the struggly beard he had. And he used to always wear this old waistcoat. I think he slept in the thing. Funny thing is, exactly 20 years ago, he was killed in those same yards. Though I would never have all the answers to that night, I came to believe what happened to me at Dingo Creek. I stumbled onto a farm where a man lay dying his wife crying for help. A plea from a father who had died 20 years earlier. I panicked. Because in my heart, I knew I'd seen a ghost. The local verdict would be plain. In a country district, I'd done the unspeakable thing of galloping away from a call for help. I'll never forget that night. I can still see it as bright as day. There are things that one should have done things one should not have done. Help one should have given and didn't. I could have done better. Seamus O'Farrell is not a man to tell stories. If it wasn't for Radar, he wouldn't tell this one. Seamus has had a real-life encounter with UFOs, unidentified flying objects officially tracked on Radar. An untold story next week. That's it for tonight. Just before we go, I'd like to show you part of a story from next week's edition. It's the story behind the book and the film, The Exorcist, a real life tale told by Raphael Abramovitz. What was it about this place or the story itself that made you uneasy? You don't exactly strike me as someone who, who would believe in a wild story, right? Oh my God. God. Do you know what this is here? Can you see this, Sheila? That w I don't remember seeing that before. I swear. You, you, you look to me like you were a little bit very uneasy just now. Yeah, I don't like it. Yeah.